Okay, Teddy and I are ready for another adventure. Let's get out the map. This time we're heading to Oka Bay. It'll be his first overnighter by bike, and as the trip organizer and dad, I'm a little nervous. I have done a lot of bike packing tours and uh, various adventures over the years, and I'm usually chomping at the bit to get on the trail. When I'm bike packing by myself or with some friends, the sense that could, something could go wrong is almost invigorating. It's like a chance to prove our mettle, see what we're really made of, show some grit. However, that is not at all how I feel as I'm thinking about taking my 12-year-old on his first overnight bike trip. On one level, I'm aware of how a mechanical failure or some other minor calamity could turn this adventure from uh, father-son bonding time to, Dad, this sucks. On another level, we will be riding past several ghost bikes uh, on our way out of the city, and uh, those are unapologetic reminders that not everybody who goes on a bike ride ever comes home. Over the years, I've had to grapple with the concept of risk in a lot of contexts, as a business owner, as a father, as a project manager, as a sailor, as a cyclist. In this video, I'm gonna share some of the uh, things I've learned over the years that have helped frame how I think about risk. This video will have two objectives. The first objective is to share how I use some well-known risk reduction frameworks. These simple exercises can have a major impact on the safety and enjoyment of any adventure because not having fun is a real risk too. The second is to help anyone who would like to go on an adventure, but they can't bring themselves to embark. They get worried or anxious, whether that's a cycling adventure or another kind of adventure. Being an active participant in managing risk can be daunting. Uh, you have to contemplate some of the worst tragedies that can happen to yourself and your loved ones, but it can also be empowering. Nothing in life is guaranteed, but good, ri bleh. But good risk management, bleh. But good risk management processes underpin the success of every human journey, from the grocery store to the moon. Hold on, the grocery store, really? Are you saying that I need to think about risk every single time I drive? Well, you probably don't, but if you live in the US of A, cars are the most likely thing to kill you until you're about 45. For my demographic, cars were twice as likely to kill somebody in 2021 than COVID, three times more likely than cancer, and seven times more likely than homicide. So driving an automobile is clearly risky, but millions of Americans do it anyway without thinking too much about risk. Proactive risk management is not something that occurs to most drivers because someone else is already doing that work. You have speed limits, road designs, crash standards. For the average driver, you can't do much better than just getting in your car and following the rules of the road, right? We'll come back to that question later, but for now, we've got a bike trip to plan. We are gonna use some of the same tools that the military, commercial aviators, and even NASA use. The checklist and the risk matrix. Born out of common sense, they cost nothing to use and are the most effective risk management tools that exist. Let's start with the risk matrix. Wikipedia tells me the risk matrix was developed by the Department of Defense in 1978 but I imagine that the principle behind it predates Homo sapiens. On the y-axis, we have the likelihood of an event occurring, and on the x-axis, how bad it is. Let's say I'm 20 miles from home on a lonesome country road, and I get a flat tire. I'm either hitchhiking or taking a walk. I will probably make it home alive, but my ride is definitely ruined, and I will probably become grumpy over the whole thing. Let's call that severe. So here we are in the middle of the risk matrix. We have the possibility of a severe situation. Are we willing to accept that? Before we can answer that question, we need to know what is the cost of changing that risk? I could make sure my phone is charged before I go on a ride. That would cost me almost nothing. If I get a flat tire, I can call a taxi and pay about a hundred bucks to get rescued. In that case, the consequence is no longer severe, but it is still significant. If I want to reduce the severity further, I could buy an extra tube or a patch kit, some tire levers, learn how to fix a tire on my own. Hmm, seems like a lot of work. I might get a greasy handprint on my bar tape. On the other hand, if a cab drives me home, then my wife will give me a hard time. I'll pretend like I'm a good sport about it, but it will sting. At this point, most of you are probably yelling at the screen like, learn how to change a tire, idiot. I do know how to change a tire. Or you're thinking, hmm, I don't know how to change a tire myself. 
Maybe I should learn. And this leads to one of the most important things to understand about risk. Risk is subjective. Buckle up, wear a mask, go base jumping, smoke weed, call your ex, cross the street. None of us are doing any sort of statistical analysis when we take any of these risks. We are just doing what feels right based on our experience and our understanding of the world. Risk has a deeply personal element as well as a deeply collective element, and we'll explore both of those. A risk matrix is not going to help you decide what to do. It is a mental framework that can help you identify and reduce risks. It is a tool that can help prevent dangerous situations from unexpectedly arising due to underpreparedness or unawareness. How many situations have you found yourself in and said to yourself, what was I thinking? A risk matrix is a tool for thinking and it is extremely powerful when combined with a tool for doing. And now we introduce the checklist, the tool for doing. I used to think a checklist was something for people who were like super absent-minded, um, but if you have ever ridden in an airplane, train, or ship, you have trusted your life to a checklist of some sort. Pre-departure checklist. Safety checklist. Step on the checklist is... Uh, safety inspection checklist. We have to do a few checks. A checklist is the repository for things you have decided to do to reduce risk. Here's a little diagram I had my daughter draw to show the relationship between the risk matrix, the checklist, and the adventure. Let's walk through it with the example of the flat tire. I think about the risk using the matrix as a framework. I decide that I do indeed want to make sure my phone is charged and I have an extra tube and the tools needed and then those items go on the checklist. If I use All risks are related to equipment. I consider risks as sort of being in three broad categories. The internal risks, the external risks, and the collective risks. Internal risks would be a mechanical failure or running low on blood sugar, something directly related to your body or your equipment. The external risks are things like getting caught in a storm or getting run over by a car. In order to identify these situations, I like to chair fly key parts of a ride. Redbird Flight School says chair flying involves taking a few quiet moments to visualize a specific procedure or task and perform each step in your mind, often by talking through it out loud and going through the appropriate motions with your hands and feet. This would take different forms depending on the type of riding involved. For some rides, wildlife and trail conditions could be a major factor and you may identify or you may imagine yourself like going down a technical descent with a certain type of panniers on your bike and then you might think, oh, these panniers may not be appropriate for this type of riding. Um, for this ride, we are cutting through the city, so I'm mainly looking to reduce the risk of being hit by a car. Often that can be done by choosing a nice separated route, but sometimes that's not possible. Here at Auto Route 13, the bike lane crosses several areas where cars are expected to merge across the bike lane and onto the highway from a three lane road. These create a uniquely dangerous conflict between people riding bikes and the cars changing lanes and accelerating onto the highway. Cars often pass other cars and cross several lanes to try and make the exit ramp. A car driving in this way would not see a person on a bike until it is too late because the cyclist would be obscured by other traffic. Highways have an ugly habit of completely cutting off access from one side of the road to the other, except for a few isolated crossings. The only other option for crossing this road is to hop a barbed wire fence with two bikes down here by the river or we'll ride way out of the way and end up crossing through an industrial area where we would have to share the road with trucks and heavy equipment, which have a hard time seeing people on bikes. Ultimately, we decided to time our ride so that we crossed at 11 a.m. on a Friday, well after the rush hour traffic has calmed down. We discussed the risk ahead of time and made sure to keep an eye on traffic conditions and ride very close to each other. We also made sure to have working lights, even though it was daylight. You can see that the Transportation Authority has also attempted to reduce this risk by painting as many sharrows as possible. I am not exactly impressed with this tactic and that brings us around to something we touched on earlier. Most of the time, we delegate risk management to local regulations and social norms. No one is making a checklist before every time they drive or even bike to work. Most people think very little about risk in their day-to-day -day life because they don't have to. Someone else is doing that for them. It could be the person who designs the highways or sets the traffic rules, but the checklist is already sort of laid out. Keep it under 70 miles per hour. Stop at red lights. 
Don't tailgate. Don't drive harm from the <laughs> don't drive home from the bar after Margarita Mondays. Of course, this does not completely prevent traffic deaths or collisions, but that is not how risk works. Reducing risk does not guarantee that nothing horrible will happen. However, sometimes we run across situations like these bike lanes in Laval, where the level of risk presented to us by whoever is responsible for the infrastructure does not feel appropriate, it does not feel like something we can accept. One of the most famous ghost bikes in Montreal uh, marked the place where Mathilde Blay was killed by a turning truck in 2014. Uh, there was substantial public outcry afterwards, which resulted in the bike lane being widened and concrete barriers installed. However, this must be some hollow consolation for their friends and family. As with many cities, finding Laval's active transportation plan was a matter of just a few minutes of clicking around. It looks like I'm not the first person to identify a risk here, and the city does have a plan to create a separated bike path under the bridge. I don't know what level of priority it is, so I dropped a line to the planning department telling them it was a big deal and asking them when they would complete the work on the alternative route. Hopefully they will get it done before anyone is hit by a car. Communicating with city governments is easier than ever, and highlighting specific safety issues does get the goods, especially if there are a lot of people doing it. If you don't know what to say or how to word it, there are tools for that. Safer design has a significant impact on the y-axis of the risk matrix, and advocating for safety is just as sensible as packing an extra tube or tire plugs. To wrap it up, risk is subjective. The risk matrix is a tool for thinking about risk. The checklist is a tool for mitigating internal risks. Chair flying is a tool for mitigating external risks. Public participation is a tool for mitigating collective risks. I hope this video makes you feel empowered to take ownership of the risks of cycling and play an active role in reducing them for yourself and for others. Thank you for watching. I hope you find this useful. If you have any feedback or comments about how you think about risk and steps that you take, please leave them in the comments. I would love to continue this discussion there. Thank you so much for watching and ride safe. No, the car, but like the car was like right up on you. And the reason why is because like the other car structured the car. It's, I don't know, anyway. Um, You. That's why I was like, why my wheel? But he did it. Like he was, he was, he saw both of us. You were close enough. It was all good.